Ring 2008 on TSN is brought to you by the new Q Horsepower from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses. And Michelin, a better way forward. This week we're in Montana, the least dense state in America with 6.5 people per square mile. Lots of land, lots of lakes, and lots of cowboys. Well, we're this week to talk about Volvo as they introduce their third generation XC70. And you know, Volvo likes to brag about the fact that 10 years ago with this vehicle, it created the so-called cross-country or crossover segment. Now, when you think of Volvo, you think safety and family. And for me, the demographic has always been a guy with a beard wearing socks and sandals. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I just don't think you should be wearing the socks with your sandals. Anyway, back to the XC70. If you notice some of the commercials they've been running recently, there are no kids in this vehicle. That's because, for all intents and purposes, the XC70 is for adults only. They appear to be uh, straying away from the family image, which uh, I found strange, but uh, on the other hand, they say that, and yet uh, there's uh, the built-in child seats in the rear of uh, the vehicles that we're using today, so I think it's safe to say that it's still a pretty family-oriented company. The XC70 is a vehicle that calls for adventure. Of course, there are families that will uh, use and drive the XC70, but we seem to be attracting um, pre-family and empty nesters, and uh, they like the, the capabilities that XC70 provides, as well as all of the convenience and, and flexibility that the vehicle has. Volvo is undergoing a, a big rejuvenation of our product portfolio, which started last year with the introduction of our retractable hardtop convertible, the C70. Uh, and then we began the year with the launch of our flagship sedan, the Volvo S80, followed by an all-new entry in our portfolio, the smallest of our vehicles, the C30 hatchback and now here we are with the launch of the XC70. So we're going to see an all new portfolio of products within the, the Volvo brand. Volvo itself, I'm uh, quite a fan, especially with uh, in the last few years of their, their newer models, things like the C30, the S40, uh, getting a lot sportier, a lot less uh, old people looking and uh, they're building some very, very nice cars. Yes, to some extent, our demographics have gotten younger uh, and more affluent, which is good. I think uh, what the design evolution has done for us is basically expanded uh, the relevance of our products to a broader range of customers. It's beautiful. That's what I like about this. Look at the taillights. Where do you see beautiful taillights like that? Broad shoulders, nowhere else. I mean, that's a, a DNA in the Volvo, if you will. We wanted to expand on the luxury of the car itself, and that's why we took the uh, technologies from the S80, as you can see, inside and out. We wanted to make sure that we even push the safety envelope a little further, and we've done that, of course, with the structure of the car, as well as the now integrated uh, dual-stage booster seat, which is the world first for us. And, of course, the all-wheel drive, instant traction. So there's quite a few things that we have, uh, we have added to this new one. We're quite pleased about that. We have the inline six-cylinder 235 horsepower engine that we have had in the XC90 and 07 and also from the S80. And we made that with a six-speed automatic transmission and of course with the all-wheel drive system standard. That's what we have on this particular car. Adequate power, I, I don't think it's going to overwhelm anybody, but a very nice inline six engine, as, as you know, and a nice transmission with it. It's not as snappy as the turbo models, but adequate power for uh, anything that uh, is going to come up in my real daily life. At this moment, Ford has its premium group, Land Rover, Jaguar, and Volvo on the selling block. The question is, if Ford does sell Volvo, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I think it's been a great acquisition for Ford. I think what they've learned from Volvo and the platform interchange and, and all the safety features that Volvo brings, I think are an excellent acquisition for Ford. And they've been incorporated in, in a lot of their vehicles and, you know, like the Taurus, etc. cetera, all based on Volvo. And I think they've uh, done extremely well. They've 
if, if I was Ford, I'd hang on to Volvo. <laughs> Based on what we saw this morning, I'm really impressed with the car. I think uh, in the uh, driving that we did in the, uh, the windy mountain roads and stuff, they really weren't afraid to show off the vehicle's ability to uh, run over washboards and potholes and all of that stuff. We drove through a very impressive car for the rough stuff and uh, handles very well also for a station wagon. Station wagon is one thing. This is not really the station wagon segment with this car, but that's why it's so unique. We kind of created that segment of crossover, if you will, and that's what people is looking for. They don't necessarily want an SUV, and neither do they want a wagon. We want something in between, and it's perfect for them. Jim, we're rolling. Oh, I'll be right with you later on Kenzie's Corner. skid pad and a great set of wheels. It sounds like a recipe for a speedy test drive. This week, Subaru's latest Impreza WRX. If imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, Mazda must be tickled pink by the Subaru 3. Sorry, make that the Impreza. The similarities are most evident in the hatchback models. The saving grace is the sedan has a strong look all its own. When dressed in rally blue, it is both vibrant and alive. The latest vehicle is also significantly larger than the outgoing model, which gives it more substance and a much needed injection of interior space. One of the improvements to this WRX is found right here. The windows now have a frame around them. The old sashless windows relied upon the glass hitting a piece of rubber to keep all the wind and road noise out. This one gives much better ceiling and so it's a quieter ride. The other upside, it improves body integrity. The second improvement, that stretch in the wheelbase equates to much more rear seat legroom. It really does make a big difference. The only thing you don't want to do if you get stuck in the middle position, you will be uncomfortable. As in past years, the WRX enjoys a spiced version of the base engine. Bolting on a turbo ups the stallion count to 224 and torque production to 226 pound-feet. The beauty is that peak torque shows up for work at just 2800 RPM. This simple fact transforms the ride from so-so to blazing. It will run to 100k in 6.1 seconds, and it turns the 80 to 120 trick in just five seconds. Both are very good and underscore the WRX's rally-bred heritage. If there is a drawback, it is that the engine always sounds gruff and angry whenever it's forced to work. For once, a functional hood scoop. All of the air that rushes through there comes down here and into this air-to-air -air intercooler. Now that cools the incoming air charge. You cool that, you can pack more air in, more fuel in, more air, more fuel, bigger bang, bigger pang, more power. And that's what gives the WRX its charm and character. The power is relayed to the road through a five-speed manual, it should have six speeds, or a four-speed automatic. Aside from the clutch pedal, the difference between the two is the all-wheel drive system. The manual box makes do with a viscous coupling to distribute the power front to rear. The automatic comes with a proactive system that actively seeks to prevent unwanted wheel spin by redirecting the power before it is allowed to overwhelm any of the wheels. In real-world use, the base all-wheel drive system is good, the one tied to the automatic is great. The inside of the WRX is not exactly what you would call inspired. However, what it loses in terms of its style marks, it more than makes up for in terms of function. To begin with, some of the best seats in the industry. They've got plenty of lateral support and they also splay at the shoulders. Now you combine that support with a perfectly placed dead pedal and you stay put when you start to play. The other thing, they've arranged everything very logically. The radio, the information up here, and the dials are all such that you can actually read everything relying on peripheral vision. The advantage, that keeps your eyes looking down the road for much longer. The WRX's 40 is found in the handling. The stiffer chassis and reworked suspension tame both body roll and understeer. The basic layout then brings the needed balance. As the entire drivetrain sits on the car's centerline, everything is balanced left to right. More importantly, the equal length drive shafts banish torque steer. In short, the WRX ate the pylon test for lunch. 
Even when pushed beyond its considerable limits, there is an electronic stability control waiting in the wings. The standard anti-lock brakes are just as effective. At 39 meters from 100k, the stopping power is exceptional. The latest WRX is a delightful package and it does a couple of important things. First of all, it comes in from the fringe and into the heart of the mainstream market and yet it loses none of its personality and character. It's got plenty of power, it handles very well and it's got a great all-wheel drive system. Now on that note, if you're a smart consumer, you'll go with the one that's tied in with the automatic. Yes, it detracts from the driving pleasure a little bit, but the advantages are more than taken care of. It also all bodes very well for the incoming STI. Closed captioning of Motoring 2008 is brought to you in part by Chevrolet. Let's go. Visit letsgochevrolet.ca. Well, as you can see, we've got a real steep descent here. But thanks to this hill descent technology um, that Volvo has, I'm going to go down this hill, take my feet off both the accelerator and the brakes, and the car will completely control the descent. You gotta have a lot of faith in this technology. Here we go. Instead of look ma, no hands, it's look ma, no feet. And you know something? This is the kind of technology that I know. Our man in the Quaker State Garage, Bill Gardner, is thinking to himself, how did I ever live without this? Right, Bill? Brad's just trying to goad me into another rant about cars that do things I didn't ask him to do. Brad, I'll decide what gear I want it in, when to apply the brakes, what gear to hold on the way down the hill. I don't want the car doing it for me, thanks. He's already got me on the rant. Anyhow, this week I want to talk about one of my customer's pickup trucks. This belongs to Marty Goodkey, a longtime customer. It's a 2000 Toyota Tundra. Now we've done short-term and long-term tests on the first generation Tundra and on the current generation Tundra pickups. We've really liked them. But you know what? There's no substitute for putting miles on a vehicle. Now this one has 233,000 K and a lot of that kilometers was put on on gravel roads. So this vehicle's subject to a lot of wear and tear and that de definitely separates the men from the boys. Now, what happened to Marty's pickup truck was he'd been driving with a kind of a low brake pedal for quite a while. He had solid feel to the brakes, but the pedal travel was a lot greater than it used to be. The pedal went down a long way before the brakes started to pick up. Then when he was towing a trailer a couple of weeks ago, all of a sudden the brake pedal went way down further and the warning light in the dash came on. What had happened then was, one of his hydraulic lines on the rear of the chassis here down the left frame rail had burst just in this general area right here there's a curve and an area where it's exposed to a lot of road splash a lot of grit flying off the tires and it knocked off some of the protective coating that's on the rear brake lines this plastic garbage that you see right here and then the line corroded out and burst and the brake fluid went out and so he lost basically both his rear brakes. Two lines going to the rear brakes had rusted out and failed. So we had to replace two sections of the rear brake line, a total of 10 feet of uh, 3 16 galvanized tubing going to those rear brakes. And when we got into the job, we found out that the drum brakes on the rear of the truck were a mile out of adjustment. Now the first generation Tundras had drum brakes on the rear axle, now they have a disc brake on the rear axle. But there's nothing wrong with the drum when it's properly adjusted and serviced. This one was a mile out of adjustment. That was the reason for his initial low pedal. So once we did this mechanical adjustment to bring the pedal back up, replaced the lines and bled the rear brakes, we had a solid pedal. But there was a third problem too that he encountered when this failure happened. He tried to apply the emergency brake. He had a solid pedal. The emergency brake pedal felt rock hard and right at the top. But in actual fact, nothing happened at the rear wheels. There was no braking action. It wouldn't hold the vehicle on a slope. It wouldn't even slow it down one iota. And what we found when we got into it was just behind the backing plate right here, there's a pivot assembly that converts the pull action of the emergency brake cable into the action that you need to apply the shoes. And that lever and pivot assembly was completely seized with rust 
so seized, in fact, that you could stand on that pedal and not budge the emergency brake. So we had to take that all apart, free it up, lubricate it, and put it back on because the parts were very expensive and available one piece at a time. You couldn't buy the whole assembly. So the easiest thing was to take it apart and fix it. Once all that was done, he had a solid emergency brake, a good high pedal. We got rid of the warning light on the dash and he had good brakes again. And these are the kinds of things that you need to the reasons why we always tell you to service the vehicle regularly and check it because sometimes you can pick up on these things before they actually cause a problem and some of these conditions were pre-existing prior to those brake lines bursting that's why it's important to do your regular inspections so till next week i'm bill gardner for motoring 2008. Pretty much everything on the inside, outside, and a lot of things underneath are all new for the 2008 Focus. We've got a very aggressive chrome uh, dual bar front end, followed up by all new body panels, front and rear fascias, um, an all new interior, available 16 inch wheels. We've got a refined and upgraded a two liter with 140 horsepower. We were able to take the horsepower up by four to 140 horsepower, and torque is also up three to 136. But at the same time, we've been able to reduce weight in the vehicle by almost 40 pounds. And at the same time, we've been able to increase fuel economy by 7% in the city and 10% on the highway. I like the look of it. The, the new look is good. Inside, it's a lot quieter. That, that was the first thing you noticed, and uh, that's really what needed to happen because it was a little bit noisy before. And the other thing is the ride quality, where the trend is for people to stiffen them up nowadays. This Focus is actually a little softer, and I think it really helped the ride quality. We took it out in the handling course. It was pretty good, pretty well balanced. Uh, both I tried both the two and the four-door models, and I also tried one of the two doors with a manual. And uh, I liked the turn-in on it. The turn-in was pretty definite. You could feel the feedback from the front wheels and uh, the brakes are very good. So overall, I think it's improved in all the areas, let's say. Phone, please say a command. Call Jonathan. We're really excited with the new uh, technology Call offered John. and debuting on, on Focus, and that is uh, called Ford Sync. In partnership with Microsoft, we've been able to combine this new software and technology into all of our Focus <laughs> that literally allows you to incorporate your Bluetooth uh, cell phones and PDAs wirelessly and through uh, voice commands. USB, please say a command. Play track Hey There Delilah. Playing track Hey There Delilah. Typically in the past, um, features such as Sync and new technologies, we've always launched them on our more premium vehicles and our expensive vehicles. The level of technology that Sync incorporates, we've been able to drive the cost down and debut it on Focus. Now, the other reason why is our target market is a very young customer that has been connected for their entire lives. With Focus being an entry-level vehicle um, in the Ford lineup, we felt it imperative to launch this new connectivity technology on Focus to meet the demands of that younger customer. Despite the popularity of hatchbacks in the Canadian market, Ford, in its infinite wisdom, has decided to drop the Focus hatchback. Really, the heart of the segment is with four-door and two-door coupes, and we wanted to rationalize a product offering to really go head-to-head -head with our competition and go at the heart of the market uh, with the uh, two-door and four-door. You know, I actually like the hatch version. I thought that was good. That's the one they used in the World Rally Championship also, but I think the coupe's a very good-looking car. Um, uh, it was good with a manual. I, I think overall it's a, it's a better car, more mainstream if you will. I think if you look at the coupe before with the lights up the top there, it was a little out there. And even though people got used to it, but I think the new coupe will sell well for it. Now, a couple of states in the United States have passed a law making it illegal to text message while you're driving. Now, on the surface of it, that seems like a reasonable thing, but I'm thinking, at what point do we have to tell people they should not do that? Can anybody figure out for themselves that that's a really stupid thing to do while you're driving? Do we have to pass a law for everything? I mean, being over 30, of course, I can barely type with two thumbs, but. I can barely hold this microphone and punch this little deal, let alone actually trying to drive while you're doing this. I mean, do we need a law saying it's against the law to 
perform brain surgery while you're driving? People, give your heads a shake. Now, there's lots of other distractions on the road. My personal favorite, a guy sorting out his vacation photographs. And a friend of mine used to be perversely proud of the fact that he could eat cereal while he was driving, not scooping it dry out of the box. No, no, we're talking bowl, milk, spoon, the whole nine yards while he's steering with his knees. My dear Lord, we've got to stop this, folks. And the worst thing is now the car companies are making it too easy for people to be distracted. We saw earlier the Ford uh, Focus with this sync system. You've got your Bluetooth phone and your Nano this and your iPod that and you're booting down the road. you got all this electronic stuff going on. Is anybody paying attention to what they're actually doing out there? Now, of course, they're trying to appeal to the young people with all this electronic stuff. They can't go a nanosecond without their nanopod blowing some kind of crap music into their ears. Of course, a bunch of years ago, BMW tried to appeal to the older folks with that iDrive electronic computer thing. That was a big success, but everybody's following them. Why? I don't know. I mean, I don't want to sound like your dad, kids, but or Don Cherry for that matter, but we kill almost 3,000 people on the roads every year in this country. And a large part of that is distraction. Can you just leave all that stuff alone and focus on your driving? I'm Jim Kinsey. One thing we've noticed in our short stay here in Montana, especially in this area around Whitefish, is a predominance of white crosses on the highway that marks where someone has been killed in a car accident. And the locals say it has nothing to do with the period of time when Montana went without speed limits. But either way, it's pretty sad to see. Nothing sad about this new Volvo XC70, though. It's the third generation. Without a doubt, it's the best. And believe me, if I had a choice between the XC70 and the XC90, I'm going with the 70. I like that low center of gravity, great drivability, well balanced, and on the off-road and the wet roads we've been driving on today, this sucker just sticks to the road like glue. Now, it could be a little pricey for the young crowd, so I think Volvo is correct in directing this car towards parents whose kids have finally moved out of the basement. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. Okay, good. I think we're out of this rally. I think so. Motoring 2008 on TSN has been brought to you by the new Q horsepower from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses and Michelin, a better way forward.